the, the kids off of Stranger Things, who our shows came out at the exact same time. So we were doing all of our press interviews and all of our media interviews in Hollywood and New York with the cast of Stranger Things, like staying in the same... My, my child was swimming in the pool with those kids, and they were kids, and yeah. now they're like grown people. But we... <laughs> but you take them... Well, they had... Th they were actors and actresses, and they had agents, and they had handlers, and they had PR reps mm -hmm. that were navigating for them how to handle the fact that they were about to be on a hit show on Netflix. Yep. Like, when that show blew up, they had a team of people saying, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Do this. Give me your phone. I'll take over your social media. I, we had nobody. Right. And so we're going through the same thing at the same time they were going through it. And actually, at one point, our numbers were beating their numbers. Mm. And we had nobody. And the criticism we didn't have a team. We didn't have – we had nothing. Today, I'm speaking with Brittany Wagner, beloved counselor from Last Chance U. Brittany shares with us behind the scenes stories from her Netflix show. She talks about being a female in a male dominated industry and the power of betting on yourself. Let's get to it. Hey, Brittany. Hey. <laughs> So thank you for, this is really exciting for me because I haven't been doing this very long, but to get someone of your caliber sitting across the table from me, and I guess I say that because it's, I never would have envisioned getting to actually speak with you because several years ago I was watching a Netflix show <laughs> and got drawn in like the rest of the country watching uh, this very unique perspective of a camera crew going into a community college setting and watching kids kind of struggle or go through the challenges of navigating the transition into, I don't know, I guess collegiate sports. Yeah. Right. Um, and you were a huge part of that. And I know I enjoyed watching your, I'll call it a character. I know it wasn't a character, it's you. Uh, but I enjoyed watching this person in a job that I didn't really know existed just right. because I wasn't exposed yeah. to it. I think all of us were in that boat. We were watching something that, unless you experienced it personally, yeah. most people are not aware that this is even happening. Yeah. I remember being excited that I was going to be on it. And it well, I didn't think anybody was going to watch it. Okay. I'll say that first. Because okay. this was Netflix before Netflix now. Right. It was, this was when, like, right after we were still checking the boxes and they were mailing the DVDs to your house. Oh my gosh, was it that long ago? Yeah, yeah it, was, okay. it wasn't modern day Netflix. And so they, there weren't all these documentaries right. to, to look at and go like, okay, this is what I'm doing. The only documentary that Netflix had put out prior to Last Chance U was Making of a Murderer, which was a huge success. Right. And I had seen Making of a Murderer, so I knew kind of – you know, what the documentary was, because documentaries weren't huge back then. Yeah, a series documentary. Right, yeah. wasn't wasn't a thing. Yeah. And so I remember thinking, though, okay, well, no one will watch this, so it won't matter, w you know, what I do won't matter. But finally, my family will know what I do for a living. <laughs> like, I relate to that. <laughs> finally, I can just show it to my family, and they'll be like, Oh, like this is what you do for a living. Because no one knew. Like no one knew behind the scenes what was going on in college football. I mean, that's a part of its success. I think it just opened the eyes to everyone that I mean, as I've gotten older, I think the realization that we all don't we aren't given the same mm -hmm. like we aren't given the same pieces to the puzzle or we aren't given the same, I don't know, deck of cards or hand of I don't right. know. There's some analogy in there yeah, that I'm yeah. supposed to <laughs> But it's not the same. And while I think, and I, we, I speak to this a lot, while we're all responsible for our own decisions, I don't, I think that that's very important. But to say that we're all, like, it's all the same and I should be able to impart right. my experience to you and be like, well, just figure it out. That's not the same. 
Right. And our country is huge. You know, the, the amount of people and the, the cities and the, the demographics and the um, economic structures that are there, they're all so different. So it's really interesting to take, like, I don't know, we got to, like, jump into your world and see yeah. what those kids, there's a lot, some of those stories were just incredible. Yeah, well, you know, I say it all the time when I speak now, we're a product of our experiences. Mm. And all of our experiences are different. And, and it doesn't make, nobody's experiences are, are wrong or right or, or, or doesn't make, your experiences don't make you better than anyone or less than anyone. They're just all different. Right. But when you when you grow up in a, in a small rural town in Mississippi that's poverty stricken and you've never even been out of that town, mm-hmm. You've never even been to the neighboring county or the neighboring town, and you're 18 years old. Right. You know what you know. And if it hasn't happened to you in that tiny town in rural Mississippi, you don't know. Right. I mean, I had, a, I had a student, Ronald Ollie, actually, from mm. season one. I asked him one day, I said, you know, look, what's, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what's your dream? And he looked me dead in the eye, and he said, Miss Wagner, I haven't seen enough to have a dream. Hmm. And when you haven't seen anything other than what your your own family has provided you, and it's not enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not enough mm-hmm. when you're when you're five years old and your father turns a gun and shoots your mother and then shoots himself, and mm-hmm. you're living in a trailer in the middle of nowhere, in Mississippi, and that's all you know. Mm-hmm. That's not enough for you to really think about what do I want to do with my life, right. you know. And and I saw I saw athlete after athlete after athlete and and some of them were from Mississippi and some of them were from California and some of them were from Detroit and some of them were from New York City. It didn't matter. It didn't matter where they were from. They would come to Tiny Scuba, Mississippi, and all they were were a product of their experiences. Mm-hmm. And if we wanted them to grow and to better themselves and to provide something different for their their own path, then we had to be willing to teach them. Yeah. Because they, they weren't going to come in with the knowledge or the wherewithal or sometimes even the work ethic to get it done. Right. And so, you know, I, you know, I think it, there's, a, there's a part of me that's like a little bit uncomfortable sometimes when people are, refer to me as, oh, my gosh, you know, you're this life changer, this lifesaver, this hero. Because I, in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, wasn't I just doing what we all should do? <laughs> like, is, isn't this kind of like why we're all on the earth? Mm-hmm is to to learn and grow from our own experiences and then share those and teach other people. Like, yeah. I, you know, I have a hard time believing that I was really doing anything other than what I absolutely should have been doing every day. And that was make trying, trying to impart wisdom and make people a little bit better for having been there. We, yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. I think it, like, there are those moments where it's like you're just – you're just sharing your story. Yeah. You're just, yeah. you know, you're, and I, and you did that. And I think not only in, you have a book as well, but I think you kind of got into some more detail about maybe the backstory of, of the narrative that you were presenting in the show. Right. Um, I wanted to back up though, cause I'm realizing maybe, maybe someone hasn't watched the show. So maybe let me yeah, give yeah, you some yeah. context. So what exactly, what, where were you and what was your role in this Netflix documentary? So I was in Scuba, Mississippi population, they say 700. I think they must have counted some cows. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) There's 700 people that actually live there, but maybe. But 700 people, it's in rural, rural Mississippi. I mean, we were 45 minutes from the nearest store. So if you needed a pencil, (laughs) you had to get in a car that was yours. You had to have a driver's license. You had to have the gas money and the gas to drive 45 minutes to a store and then buy the pencil. That alone, that reality is not. That, it's not normal. That's, that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. It doesn't make sense to most yeah. of America. Yeah, but it was the reality that we were living in. And right. so we were 45 minutes from the nearest anything. Um, we were located in the second poorest county in the United States of America, mm. Kemper County, Mississippi, at the time that we filmed season one was the second poorest county in the United States. Median income was like $11,600. That's wild. I mean, a year. So you had, we also had a football team where at the time we were only allowed eight out-of-state scholarships. So what that means is you've got eight guys coming from other other states, other situations. And, and even those guys, you know, one of them could be from Eight Mile Detroit or from Compton, California. It's not like you're, you're not pulling eight, <laughs> I mean... 
you know, most of the time they weren't from much better situations. Mm -hmm. But the majority of our team was from Mississippi and from Kemper County and from that area. And so when you have 65 guys on a team from the second poorest county in the United States, you know, or from the, the, the poorest state in the United States, uh, I mean, <laughs> you got a show, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you got you got something. And so um, I was there. What happened was we were a school, we were a junior college, a community college, so a two-year program. And the dream of the president at the time was we can really propel this whole institution if we propel athletics. Mm -hmm. If we will sink our money into creating a dominating athletic program, people will wake up and know we're here and people will come. Mm -hmm. If you build it, they will come okay. was kind of his, right. his motto. And so he hired the coach and then he hired myself and, and we kind of came up with this plan. Like, how are we going to get this school whose doors are on the verge of closing because no one's coming here, whose football team won four games the year before, like how are we going to build a program? Mm -hmm. And so we built it based off of books and ball. We knew that if we could get players academically eligible and get them in a situation where D1 coaches would feel secure recruiting them, if we could fix the discipline issues you know, that they had had prior and get them just on a, tr on a track where they could somewhat be successful in a different environment, um, they were good enough athletes to where we would get some attention. And so we started with that first class just, just I mean, it was, it was like balls to the wall, for lack of a better term, of just like really taking these. We would take keys away from guys if they had a car and say like, no, it is books and ball. Like this is a rehabilitation center and you are here. You came in and really – parented, at least what we saw on yeah. the show. And I'm assuming that was kind of a, a normal oh, yeah. uh, relationship <laughs> yeah. with these kids. Because I think it's, in some of the situations, you saw that there wasn't a lot of parental guidance for whether just they were absent or for... Right. Or, or they were first generation college students. And mm. so there may be parents in the picture, but those parents had never been to college. That's, yeah. So they didn't know. Yeah. You know they, didn't, they didn't know what the expectation was. And so I was the person, um, I was an athletic academic counselor was my title. Um, I was the person charged with making sure that they met the academic requirements to play Division One football. Okay. And then I, my just, mom, just a little thing, just a small <laughs> little thing. We you know when Nick Saban's calling you because he's like, "You got our player ready to come to Alabama." You don't want to say, "Oh no, sir." You know we're we're one GPA point away. You you don't want that to be your answer. That's great so yeah. So and I like to say that academic issues are never about academics. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time. I don't think anybody wakes up wanting to be a failure. Mm. So I don't think anyone is sitting there going like, ah, just today I'm going to screw it all up. You know, today I'm going to flunk that class or I'm going to flunk that drug test and right. today is the day that I'm going to like mess it all up. I, I just don't think anybody goes into, into anything in their life with that mentality. I think academic issues are a product of not knowing or a product of a social or emotional need not being met. When you've got kids that have lived in extreme poverty or abuse, have had tra extreme trauma in their lives, at some point their brains stop functioning at the same capacity as someone who didn't. Yeah. I think when you're when you're stressed and traumatized and worried and you don't know where your next meal is coming from, it's really hard to sit in a desk and worry about a math test. And so until we, you know, and that was kind of my goal is, look, the only way that we're going to be able to help these guys be successful academically is to pay attention to them as human beings. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I mean, I, the beauty of what you guys captured was that, and, and you were, that was, that was your role was kind of, I mean, there was the coaches that were, you know, doing the athletics and we're talking about the dynamics of these kids. Like the, I, that's also an education for a lot of people. If you didn't do collegiate sports, you don't know the process mm -hmm. to what's all required, what they can and can't do, what you know, how what the relationship between the college and the athlete is. But I think we all fell in love with the show because of it. I know it's been said before, but like you did bring that heart aspect into uh, the show, yeah. and it, it did allow kind of the breaking down. And you saw. I mean, the older I get, the the younger the 18-year-old kids look, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, oh, you're a baby. And I, I get it. We're an adult and you're a man and you can make your own decisions. But you really did see, um, when you broke things down, you saw little boys in, yeah. in so many of these these huge athletes yeah. uh, with all this bravado and they're trying to make it, trying to figure out what they want to do. But it, when it came down to it, they were a lot of them were just terrified 
or, or, or just didn't know. Yeah, I would say terrified of failure. Yeah. I think athletes, when you're that good and when you perform at that high of a level, there's an expectation that you can maintain that mm. for every area, for every, forever and for every area of your life. You know, and so I think there's this fear of what if I'm actually not as good as everybody thinks I am? And I think we all have that. I mean, it's called imposter syndrome, Mm -hmm. you know, where we all have that fear of like not being what everybody thinks we are. Um, And I but I think athletes have it at a heightened level because they are so good on the field that I think a lot of times there's an overcompensation there, you know, that they've become so good on the field because they're overcompensating yeah, their how their maybe maybe their home life was a mess, and so they wanted out of the house, so they would go throw the football a hundred times a day. Well, throwing the football a hundred times a day then made them better at football, and then it's like we pour everything into that, so we don't have to face this. Mm. We all do it. Yeah, it just our our football may be something else, and so I think you know for them there's this huge fear of of failure and and fear of being found out, yeah. like fear of being found out that like yes I'm a really good wide receiver but I can't read. You know, yes, you all love me and think I have a great personality, but in secret, you I'm know, a secret, or I, I, I've, I, I've done I'm, this thing. I've done this thing, yeah. or I've, I, this is who I really am. And so I, I think there's there's that fear all the time of of being the big disappointment. You know that, and and sometimes I think it's the fear of being what exactly what everyone told you you would be, because I think a lot of these guys had heard their whole life, you, you better be good at football because you ain't never gonna be good at anything else. You know, are you, are, are you, you ain't crap, you ain't ever going to be crap, you know. So, right. like, I think there's, you know, a lot of them, it, it was it was the replaying of negative self-talk over and over and over again from everything that everybody had said to them for 18 years of their life. And you're trying to break that cycle of. And you're, and again, back to that, they're young. You're asking a young person without all the tools of life, without right. the the nuances and understanding the realities of like, that really won't matter in five years. Right. And in 10 years, you yeah. won't care about this. And it's going to be different. You don't have that reality at that age. No. It's, it's no. the here and now, and it's intense. Yeah. And, and then you're making decisions that are going to, I mean, these guys do have talent. They are, you know, they could be something. And you're there to kind of make sure, like, well, let's use this correctly and get you get you where we need <laughs> to, to try. go. Yeah, yeah to try. But that that negative self talk has been like a big just. And, I, and I'm <laughs> I'm in my late 30s, and I'm dealing. I like just realizing how influential that is. And wow. if you don't choose to take control of that narrative that's in your brain, for me, that's been the like. It's hard because sometimes you get down it and you're like, oh, no, I, I deserve to feel this way and I'm going to be in it. And <laughs> but if you don't, you got to be able to, okay, feel it for a second, but then we got to, we, we got to move. move on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, is that what you, I think you wrote that in your I book. Did. Like I you did. I did. Yeah. I give myself hours. 24 hours yeah. to sit in an emotion. I think it is important to feel the emotion. I think we, you know, we numb a lot of stuff in this country. <laughs> Uh, yeah. A lot of different ways. <laughs> yes. We know a lot of stuff. And I think I honestly feel like that's why we are where we are right now in, mm-hmm. in the state of, of where we are in life and in this country and in this world is because we've been numbing for so long mm-hmm. and you can't. It comes out. It's going to come out in a human being, in a, in a community, in a population, in a people. It's going to come out at some mm-hmm. point. And I think, you know, you, I think it's important to feel whatever you're feeling. And feelings are valid. It's the story that we make up surrounding mm. the feeling that it probably isn't. Mm. You know, the feeling of being hopeless are, are, is real. I mean, there are moments in people's lives where, yes, you, you, you're allowed to feel hopeless. Right. But the story surrounding why you feel hopeless, and is that true? You know, is it true that you will never be able to get yourself out of the situation? Probably not. And that hopelessness stems, stems from the story. You know, the feeling will go away. Nothing's permanent. So the feeling will move on. But a lot of times we don't allow the feeling to move on because we're still replaying the story. Right. And if we would let go of the story, you know, then we can get ourselves out of that feeling. And so I try to tell myself, you got 24 hours to be pissed off, to be sad, to whatever. You got 24 hours, girl. Feel it, cry it, hit it. I don't know. Do what you got to do. But after that 24 hours, you got to turn the story off because it's a lie, you know, and you got to get up and like, like, let's, you gotta let's, move. let's go. Yeah. Even, and I, 
my thing has been like, even if it's the wrong direction, of course, I want to do everything I can to move again in the right direction. But even if it's in the wrong direction, I can always stop and yeah. correct it. Yeah. And it's, I think it's that movement that has, like, you got to just keep going. Because if I stay here, it's not getting any better for right. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So at least let's try to start moving and, and maybe it's not the right decision right away, but we'll 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 start ping ponging and maybe we'll eventually move forward yeah. to where it makes sense again and okay, now I can I just, can figure this out again. Yeah. Just getting up and like just just taking the step. And like you say, it doesn't have to be the step in the right direction. It can be a little to the left, a little to the right. Hell, it may be completely behind you. But just move like get up and do something because otherwise you you sit in it too long and you're not getting up anymore. And then you, and then it's not a choice. Then you can't. Right. You know, like you get yourself in a situation where it's not even a choice of, of am I going to or do I want to? Now it's a choice of like I can't. I, I don't have the capacity or ability to do it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that was my first rule with all the guys. We would have our first academic team meeting and I would say, rule number one, you're going to go to class. And that was my point. Mm -hmm. It's like we're not going to sit in our dorm rooms – and and numb out, whatever it is. We're not going to have a bad practice and then, you know, have this self-pity and skip all our classes tomorrow because coach yelled at us yesterday. Like, we're not doing this. Every single day you will get up and you will go to class. Was that your show up? That was my point? show yeah, up. You're like, you're going to – because – because in in, cla in the classroom setting, you're not gonna you're not gonna make the best grade possible in a class that you don't attend. Right now, there's people smart enough to make a C or a B in a class that they don't show up for, but you could have made an A. And are we trying to be mediocre or are we trying to live our best life? And so that's what I say in the book: is look, you're not going to live your best life in a life you don't show up for. You may come out mediocre, and it may be okay, and you may lay on your deathbed and go. All right, I lived a pretty good life. I survived it. <laughs> I, yeah, I survived, or I did okay for myself. You know, I hate when I hear people say that. Oh, I, I did okay for myself. What What does that even mean? Like, I, no, you didn't. Like, <laughs> I mean, you didn't because because in order to live the best life possible, you got to actively show up. I mean, you, you got to try. You got to commit. You got to put forth some effort. You got to work. You know, and and that was why I was so just concerned with class attendance. I was just, that was that was all I wanted in the beginning was just go to class because when you can just go to class and you can walk in the door, you're showing me that you at least care. Like, yeah, like you're putting forth at least minimal effort. And I can work with somebody that's putting forth minimal effort. I can't work with somebody that's not willing to care or willing to try. Yeah. There's I nothing I can do. I don't want to be going chasing you and trying to pull you back in. Yeah, no, which like I will. But I mean, it's so well, that was part of your job. <laughs> I think I did do that a couple times. But I, you know, I'm not going to be able to change your life. Right. I can do it. I mean, I can pick you up and make you go and walk you over there and handhold you. I can do all that. But your life will not change. You you want them to acquire the tools themselves. Because, yes. yeah, you could do it physically for them. And you'll get them through a semester, a class, a, 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 a moment. But right. Yeah, that that's not something that translates to the future, right. which is definitely what you're you're trying to get these kids to is like you right, have a future yeah. ahead of this. Out, college and sports are going to end, but we want you to be a productive, successful human being, not mediocre. Right. And, and you you you've got to be able to do it on your own. Yeah. You and they do have I mean, the deck was stacked against a lot of these yes, kids for yes, sure. Yes. How many before Netflix to pro, Netflix approached you? How many years had you been in that position? I had been there in that position for six years before we filmed the show. Okay. So, and I filmed for two years. So, I was there a total of eight years. Okay. Which, when I took the job, it's the classic like, I was working in the SEC. So, in, in the South, we think that's the best athletic conference in the country. I know other people <laughs> will be like, whatever. The eye roll will happen when I say that. But, but you know, I was working in the top athletic conference in the country. I was a young academic counselor working with football and men's basketball. I mean, I was charter flights to Madison Square Gardens. I mean, it, you know, it was the whole thing. And then I take this job in Scuba, Mississippi. And when I took it, I took it because I was a young female in a man's world. And I thought, okay, I've got to be able to establish myself. Like me just being in the room isn't good enough. It would be good enough if I were a man, but it's not good enough because I'm a female. And I thought, I've got, to, I've got to take a job. I need to take this job and a job that I'm building it from the ground up and that it's, like, really hard. And that other people look and go, yeah, there's no way. Mm. Because then I'll have the respect that 
an equal, you know, may have just for walking in, a a man may have just for walking in the room. So I took the job and I said to myself, I'm going to do that three years. I'm giving myself three years. That was our goal. We said we could take the job and we said within three years we could win a national championship. What was the, I'm sorry, to, no. but was the goal when that program was being established and it was the president of the school that was trying to put that together, yeah. was the goal like, re, not rehabilitation, but was the goal the kids or was it just to kind of sustain the school? The goal was to win. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> the goal was to win because winning would sustain the school. Okay. Okay. The doors would stay open. He thought, you know, look, people, if, if we give people a reason to have pride in this school, if we give people a reason to come to campus or come to school here through Ethla, and that, and he thought in his mind, like, if we win, you know, people will want to wear the gear. People will want to come. Which people is college will, sports. Which is college sports. Yeah. And he was right. right. You know, I mean, he was ultimately right. But the goal was to win. Now, the... The back story of that is they all knew college athletics and they knew that in order to win, we had to be able to get Division One players who messed up. So that player that gets kicked out of Alabama, we needed that player to be placed at our place. And, and then we had to be able to get them back out and eligible for the D1. Well, if you're if you don't have somebody managing their character, their choices, their decisions and their academics, it ain't happening. Right. Because they're a product of their experiences, yeah. and they're not going to be able to do it on their own. So that's where I can. And you're in. dealing with someone who's already messed up, so right. we're kind of in another hole. Where right. We're, okay. We and so that's it. where I fit in is you know being that person. Um, but I took that job and I said I'll be here three years. I'm going to be here and I'm going to win the first national championship. I'm going to get my ring and I'm going to I'm going back to big time SEC or wherever. I'm I'm going back to the big time. And I was eight years later. I was still sitting there. Yeah, well, your life. I, I don't. I don't think you anticipated this. Uh, all no, of. you don't dream this. So, so I got, I'm trying to. I, I've read the book. I, I know your story, but I, I like. So, did Netflix just go? Hey, let's. We see something special here. We wanna. We wanna create this. Did they know what they were coming after with you? Ah, no, they yeah. didn't know I existed. Okay. okay. They, they got. Yeah, they were like, wait, who is this? Um, So GQ Magazine came in. We got a quarterback by the name of Chad Kelly, who is Jim Kelly's nephew, quarterback for the longtime quarterback for the uh, Giants. And so we got Chad. It was a kind of a big story, a little bit more nationwide story than we than our players had had before. So when we get Chad, GQ Magazine kind of goes, what is going on down here in this? Where is this? What is this? So GQ decides they're going to do a feature story on our program. They come in, do this feature story. They send a writer who spends six months. You want to talk about somebody who works hard for, like, nothing? Six months in scuba to write a 400-word article. Crazy. Okay. Crazy. That's dedication. So he was six months at our place following everyone around. He writes this feature story for GQ magazine. And half of it is on the football, the players, and half of it is on the part of college football that he didn't even know existed. Me. So I am thrilled because I'm like, oh, wow, like I'm going to be in GQ magazine. Finally, people are going to know what I do for a living. They sent a photographer in. We did a photo shoot. I mean, I had never had anything like that happen to me. I, I, you know, I'd never even been in the local newspaper. So I was pumped. So I go to the bookstore. I open up GQ magazine. I'm so excited. I've told all my friends and family, like, this is the day. Matthew McConaughey's on the cover. It doesn't get any better than that. And I open up the article and I am cut from the story. like no mention of me existing. Mm. And I sat on the bookstore floor and cried my eyes out Mm. because I thought in a way I thought this validates what I've always thought to be true. That like, I don't matter. Mm. The woman in the story doesn't matter. And so I, I like, I just, I, I mean, it was one of those moments where it was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't show up for these guys every day and fight this fight and try to break these ceilings for everybody that's going to come after me and then just constantly be ignored and constantly be kicked. And, like, and I put the magazine back and put them all back on the shelf, walked out of the store sobbing, you know, and I just was done. I was done in a lot of ways. And so, I don't know, Netflix gets that GQ magazine article. They had just made Making of a Murderer. It was a huge success. So they decided, okay, this is now going to be our thing. We're going to produce original series documentaries. And so they were looking for a sports documentary. Somebody plops down a GQ magazine on the table. 
This is our story. in the headquarters of Netflix office and says, "This is our story." They find the producer. They call the school. Well, they don't know I exist because I'm not she in the article. article. <laughs> and so they they may do all of the meetings, and I don't know what's going on. Nobody tells me anything. They sit down in one of the last like production meetings before they come to campus to film. And Drew Jabera, who wrote the article for GQ magazine, is in the room. And he's they're going over all the concepts and all the things that they're going to do. And Drew's like, wait a minute. Where's Brittany Wagner in all this? And the Netflix producer is like, who is Brittany Wagner? And he's like, dude, you don't have a show if you don't have her in it. And then he gave them the uncut version of the GQ magazine article that had half of it was about me and my role. And at that point, I get the call from the producers. That was like in April, and we started filming in like June. So it was like, I mean, I had no time to think about, and I actually, I said no first because I was in that spot of feeling like nobody cares, right. and you're going to come film me, yeah. and I'm going to do, I'm going to sacrifice, and I'm going to do all this, and get here 30 minutes early for all of your stuff, and y'all are going, and then I'm going to be cut out of the show. I'll be in one scene. You know, because you got to put the token female in there and then that'll be it. And I was like, I'm not doing it. No, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it for that reason. I also didn't trust Hollywood. I thought they're going to come to Mississippi, film a bunch of, of guys on a football team from rural Mississippi and make fun of us. Mm. Mm. And the rest of the world will laugh at these hicks, you know, down here in rural Mississippi. And and so I just was like, I'm not signing up for this. Like, I don't, I, you know, and so then... Greg Whiteley, the producer, called me called me and said, "Look, can we can we talk about it? Like, can you write down your list of concerns?" Mm. And I was like, "Absolutely." And four pages later, <laughs> he was like, "Oh wow, you're going to regret that. You've <laughs> thought this through." I'm like, "Oh, absolutely, I've mm. thought this through." And so we went through, and and he finally, um, I got to know him a little bit, started believing him, you know, a little bit, trusting him a little bit, and so I said yes, and then. We were filming. I mean, I didn't have time to think about it. It was crazy. And it was pretty – I mean, they just came in and filmed you. There wasn't a lot of production as far as preparing to be on set or preparing no. to be mm-hmm. on camera. And no, I had no it idea was, what I was doing. It was reali- true reality <laughs> television. Oh, yeah. They were. I had a cam- one cameraman who would usually be stationed behind me. I had a sound tech, storyline producer, and a, and a PA that were assigned to me. And, I mean, we would get there and, and – I would get mic'd up and I mean, you know, there we didn't have the lights and all that. I mean, I didn't have a, you know, people, it's funny, people are always like, you know, you can put your ring light and I'm, I'm like, I do not own a ring light. Like, I don't know. I was on TV for two years with no lighting and I'm like, look, it is, is what I look like <laughs> and everybody knows it. So we good. But, <laughs> but I, you know, we just, we, they just filmed. They would turn the camera on when, and then they would leave it rolling and, um, I, you know, I would tell them when I had to go to the bathroom to turn it off. And that was about it. I mean, it was all day, every day. Um, there were certain athletes that didn't want to be on camera that didn't sign the waiver okay. and they would, we would know, you know, and so they would turn off for certain situations like that. But I mean, for the most part, we were just rolling. Did you have any control over any of the narrative? No. Okay. Which was scary. Yeah. Was scary. That's very vulnerable. I think it's scary when you're signing that. Yeah. And Netflix is at the top of it. You know, and I, I had a friend at the time who I didn't have my own attorney. I didn't have an agent. I was a nobody. I was a girl from Mississippi that was an academic counselor. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. And I had a friend that was an entertainment attorney in Nashville for, for country music stars. And I sent him, like, the word doc on email. And I was like, can you read this and tell me if I'm an idiot? And he basically said, you're an idiot. Oh. Because... <laughs> Why would you sign something that you have no creative control over? Like, mm-hmm. they could film you, Brittany, and they could take – and he called me. He's like, I just want you to understand that they could film you for 24 hours, and they could take a clip from the first hour where you say half a sentence and then a clip from the last hour where you say another half of a sentence, and they could fuse the two clips together mm-hmm. to where you're saying something that never came out of your mouth. Like, they have complete control. And according to this contract, you can't even tell them when to turn the camera off. Yikes. And he was like, so you just, I just need you to know. You're at their mercy. Yeah. And, and I was an idiot because I signed it. Well, <laughs> well it, it worked out pretty well. There's got, I mean, I, there's always risk. There's, there's always, always there's, risk. And so, but I think, I mean, he's val- he's been validated because we've seen Netflix documentaries where people 
have definitely agreed to be a part of the documentary, but then get painted not real favorable by the end of the documentary. And whether that's because it's the truth or did they know? I'm like, I'm assuming you wouldn't have agreed if you knew that was going to be the narrative that would be produced at the end. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely. But again, back to that risk thing is stepping out into those areas and going. Yeah. I mean, without the risk, there's no reward. Yeah. And can you imagine? I was thinking about this the other day. What if I had said no? Mm. And I was still sitting in Scuba, Mississippi. Oh, my gosh. Like, when I think about that, I'm just like, (laughs) holy hell. Like, I don't know. (laughs) Whatever it was that came over me that day that just trusted and said, like, it's going to be okay, please, like, please and thank you. Like, come back every day Mm. and thank you. Mm. I don't know what it was. There's so many parts of the the last five, seven, seven, five to seven years of my life where I, I look back and go, I have no idea what that was. I have no idea what it was that day when I signed that paper, knowing what I was getting myself into. I have no idea what that was. It was something bigger than me that just said, you know, and I had done my research. Yes, I didn't go into it just completely blinded. I mean, I had done my research. I'd met with Greg. I trusted Greg. I'd seen some other documentaries that he had done where I knew he could have ripped people apart and he didn't. I mean, I had the background information, but still. You were still at the beginning of that whole thing. I mean, what Netflix is now known for, you were at the beginning of that. I mean, we started it. And, 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 you know, to look back now and think like – if I knowing now what I know, would I sign the document? I don't know. Oh, that's interesting. You know, there's a little bit of naivety yeah. into that of really not knowing what you you know, just not knowing what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. Um, and then I think too, the other thing is, and I've learned, I'm starting to learn this about myself. And like you said, you know, you're in your late 30s. Well, I'm in my mid 40s, and I feel like I'm just now kind of getting it together. Like I'm just now figuring out my, a whole lot of who I am in my life, which is really right when your body starts whew. going, it's going to get older. And you go, I know. Yeah. I'm just right figuring when it out. everything shuts down. I'm like, I'm finally figuring this out. Now I, but, but I, you know, I, I, I have finally figured out. To bet on myself, mm. which, you know, that's – I don't think I did that ever, really. And, and when I look – if you had asked me a couple years ago if I was betting on myself that day when I signed that document, I probably wouldn't have given myself credit. I would have said, like, no. No, I was betting on Netflix or I was betting on whatever, whatever. But the reality is I was betting on myself because in the back – I, 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 was, I was saying to myself, like, Brittany, let them film you. Let them film you all day, every day for six months because you're going to be good at it. You're, you're good at your job and you're not going to do anything that, that you don't want people to see because that's the kind of person you are. Mm. And I, at the time, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. But now I look back and I'm like, you know, I, I signed it because I believed in myself and I believed in the work that I was doing. And I knew that like, OK, film me. I got nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, I show up every day and I work my butt off and I love these kids. Mm. And that's what you're going to see. That ownership that you were, wh- whether knowingly or unknowingly, were, were, like you were taking that, that as we get older, when you're able to see that, and those moments are so yeah. valuable. I mean, like, it's what you're saying, basically. But it, I think that is such a cool part of getting older is when you can see those examples in life where you did like, oh, because I have that quality. Yeah. And it's not me being an egomaniac by saying, like, right. I can do this well. It's it's going – it, and not to do the male-female thing, but you watch men do it all the time. It's yes. very natural. And it's, and it's a great attribute. It's something that I would love to emulate more, but they get to do it so easily. Mm-hmm. Or it's just something that's natural for the male mind. And for whether it be culturally – the way we're programmed, or if it's just the way we are physically, chemically programmed, it's harder for women to do that for some reason. Yeah. And there's not always a place to do it. There's not always like a, you kind of have to like force your way in and that feels uncomfortable too. Because it it's like, well, I want, I'm going to say this thing that I'm uncomfortable saying and then I have to like force it in to be like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. Well, and I think in the South, you know, growing up my whole life in the South, Southern women, it's it's starting to change. But, you know, when I was younger, Southern, we were supposed to be ladies. Mm. <laughs> and so Southern women, you cross your feet at the ankles, you sit up straight, and you be quiet. Oh, okay. Look pretty and be quiet. Like, that's what Southern women do, you know, or did. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, you know, that was kind of the message. It's like, 
you don't want to be too emotional. You don't want to be too loud. You don't want to be too much of anything. <laughs> this is why I don't like, live in this Be house. small. Be small. That's what. That's where you're gotcha. supposed to be is small. And, and, you know, and so I feel like when I decided to work in college athletics, it was like you can be anything, but if you're small, you're going to get eaten alive. Mm. You know, and so you're walking in every meeting and everything, and it's like you have to be loud and you have to be emotional and you have <laughs> to stomp your feet and throw the temper tantrum or, or you're just going to be ignored. Yeah. You know, and so I think I, you know, I, I learned the hard way, like how to be heard and be seen and then eventually how to give myself credit, you know, and, and, and bet on myself. Mm. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is I did it the day I signed the contract and then I did it the day I walked off the set mm. because I'd been there for two years and or eight years and I'd been filming for two years and I wasn't getting paid and um <laughs> that real when you revealed that in the book ah, i was everyone is shocked that is shocking what's shocking too is that my mom one day calls me and she's like Brittany, i googled you i'm like okay well that was your first mistake and she i'm like don't ever do that ever again and she's like but it says your net worth is 2 million dollars and i was like yeah it's a lie like people <laughs> like there is everyone is assuming that the checks are rolling in from Netflix because Netflix doesn't want to talk about it. Right. The documentary subjects don't want to talk about it because now we're being treated a certain way because everybody thinks we have money. And in reality, I don't want that treatment to stop. It's good, yeah. That's, I, 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 this is nice. opportunities and conversations. I, yeah, and yeah because all you people think I have money. And, and so it's like this catch-22 where nobody will ever stand up and say, like, hey, we're not – we weren't compensated for this. And when I when I wrote it in the book, my editor, my publisher called me and said, I don't think we should put this in the book. And I was like, well, I'm not writing the book if we're not putting it in there. Good for you. That's amazing. Because look, this is re this this is what happened. Yeah. Like I I did max out a credit card at TJ Maxx nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> buying my wardrobe for that show. Mm. You know, I did, I, I mean, I, you know, like that was a part of the story. Was that the day we started filming? I had seven dollars in my bank account, mm -hmm. you know, and and I wasn't getting paid to do this. And and two years later, and I mean, I, after season one, I had an agent, and I did have people advocating for me. And we did go to Netflix and say, like, you've just made a ton of money off. Like, this show is in the top five most binge watch shows in the world. Like, come on, and right. you want her to film a season two? Like, come on, you, you gotta compensate it. her right. in some way. And so I had an agent, a very good one, you know, advocating for that and. Netflix wasn't budging. I mean, they, they're Netflix. Mm -hmm. Like, they're like, oh, whatever. Well, you know, weren't budging. And so we fought and fought and right up until the day one of filming season two. And my agent called me and he said, all right, you can strike and not film mm -hmm. and sit there with your arms crossed, you know, and, to, and, and well, we can see, you know, call their bluff. Or we can fig you can figure out a way to make money otherwise. And I, I, sh I went on strike for a couple of days. I didn't film for a couple of days. And then it just hit me like, th you know, this is not why I'm, I didn't take this job. I didn't do any of this. And it wasn't on this show. Like, who are you, Brittany? Like, mm. don't, don't do, don't sell out. You know, like you're here for, to, to, to change these guys' lives. You were on the show so pe other people could see it and be inspired by it. Like now, why are you all of a sudden throwing a temper tantrum because you're not getting paid? And there's two sides to that story, though. You know, there's that That's side right. of it. And then there's also the side of it that, you know, there were a lot of people getting paid. <laughs> and the person doing the work wasn't. So there's like, Meh. But I, I was like, you know what? I'm going to film the show. And then I spent the entire season two trying to figure out how I was going to monetize it. Okay. So you were thinking outside the I was the thinking show. the whole time. Okay. Like, how am I going to monetize this? Like, what can I do? And then, then, then to bet on myself and say, I'm out. I'm walking away from a show that is wildly successful that I probably could still be filming right now if I had sat there for free, though, mind, mind you. I'm walking away from a, a steady paycheck, benefits, a job that I love and that I've had for eight years. Like, I'm, gonna, I'm walking away, and I'm walking away to prove a point. It was a powerful moment when you <laughs> walked away on the show because it, yeah. it did seem like – I don't want to say it, it seemed like the wrong decision, but it seemed like a, I did not see that coming. Yeah. Like, that's not how this, my brain wanted to be like, no, no, she's supposed to, <laughs> she she can't leave. What are we going to do if she leaves? Like, the, this is, yeah. and to be, yeah. So it, it was, like, I think there, maybe I've just created this in my mind, but I literally think that there is, like, a shot of you, like, walking across the campus. No, there as is. There, and, like, I remember that in, in, the, yeah. in the show. Yeah. 
so f- I just love that. I mean, these are t- again, these are things that you're 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 you knew you were good at this. You knew you were important in the show, yeah. but you're taking that risk and betting on yourself. And I think, and I don't know if it was like as a female, like I was like she's she's got to have something else figured out. Like she's going somewhere else. And not that you had the answer, yeah, but that you're willing to to move, yeah, and to go, okay, I've done what I wanted to do here. I'm satisfied with this, but it's it's now time for me to move on. And to, I, that's such a, that's got to be such a small voice, especially when you're listening to mm-hmm. Netflix and producers mm-hmm. and show and, and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And plus the and the energy of the the school itself to say, I know yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go do something different. I was scared to death. Oh, I, I was scared. And I think back now and I'm like, what the heck? Like, how was I that brave? How did I have that much confidence? Like, what was I doing? I mean, and it's worked. Look, it has worked. But but I look back and I think, who was that person? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't I didn't know that that, you know, that part of me existed. I, I, don't, I don't think or I wasn't giving myself credit for that part of me having existed. But yeah, I mean, I was walking away. Look, I, I did, I did have the belief that I had done everything I could do there. I mean, I, I, what else was there to do, you know? And I did also have the belief that Netflix would ride that wave as long as they could. I mean, they would continue to film me sitting at that desk forever, and I did not have any indication that I would ever be compensated for it. And so, there was all that. There was also the whole relationship between myself and the coach. And the abuse that was happening there and how I just was done. I was just done putting up with it. I was done with nobody doing anything about it. And I think also in the back of my head, there was the backstory, which no one knew until I wrote the book. You know, no one knew that I wasn't getting paid. No one knew, you know, that that what I was, the fight that I had been fighting to be seen and to be heard, not just with Netflix, but with the school and with the coach Mm. and, and with college athletics. And then... You know, and so there was a part of it, the me walking away, that was, I'm doing this to prove a point. Mm. Like, I'm doing this to because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Like, it's you're, it's not okay. It's not okay that you have me sitting here every day, you know, and you're not compensating me. Right. Or you're not even giving me a wardrobe allowance. Or you're not even really acting like I matter in the whole thing. Mm. And, I mean, and, yeah, and nobody knew. You know, you're watching it and you're like, what is she doing? Like, why is she, you know, but I, and I think if everyone had known the backstory, though, I think I, I think there would have been like some massive applause. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, it, I agree. I think, uh, yeah, it was I what you, what you revealed in the book and kind of giving that context to what was going on. I think kind of as I've gotten older, I've, I've touched here and there with some production stuff. So it does kind of make sense, like where you're you can see how those types of arrangements get made. And, and yeah. now we all well. Maybe it's a little more public how Netflix operates. Uh, yeah. So it makes sense, but it's definitely not what we were thinking as it as we were yeah. watching yeah. it. Yeah. When I know you mentioned that there were like there was while they were filming, there were kids that weren't like maybe that storylines that weren't included. For right. Yeah. That was there any time that like it was just that you wanted to just turn it all off? Because yeah. I feel like your job was so emotional. You had to be invested in these kids. So when something happened, I mean, the heartbreak was your heartbreak for them. Yeah, yeah. And you conveyed that. I mean, I think that's the beauty of, of you being on that show is you conveyed that so well. Uh, but was there any time where you were just like, turn the camera? Did you get ever to say turn the cameras or where you wanted to say turn the cameras off? I, I probably said it a couple times. And, and look... The beauty of all of it, too, that people don't see is you become like family with the crew. Mm. And I had the same I had the same people with me the whole time, the same cameraman, same sound tech and all that. So the beauty of it is, is that they start to care about you and you care about them. And there's this relationship there. And so, you know, yeah, I mean, there were times where I couldn't take it anymore and I would say, turn it off. And they would turn it off, you know. And, and yes, in the contract, they didn't have to. But they're good people, and they cared about me, and they would do it because they could tell I was I was at my breaking point, and they would turn it off. Um, now, after they would turn it back on, never failed. You know, the producer would be right in my face, like, talk about what, so what happened to there, you know, and you're like. <laughs> what were you feeling? Like, I don't want to talk about my feelings. Get out of my face. But, um, but, yeah, there were moments where I could say turn it off. There were a lot of moments where I wanted to say turn it off. Mm. 
but I knew it was going to be important. Like I knew that that's why I wanted them to turn it off Mm -hmm. because either I was about to get vulnerable or a player was about to get vulnerable or there was about to be some real life shit. (laughs) (laughs) And that that was the entire reason we were doing the show. And so I would, you know, I would just have to tell myself like, no, you've got to, that's why you're here. That's why you're here. Yeah. Like, let them, let them roll, you know. Do you think there was anything, like, any detriment to the kids themselves? Because, I mean, they are kind of the the principal player in, yeah. in this story that you, that's being presented. These The consequences will directly affect them. It, yeah. Having a film crew, was there, do you think there I, was anything? I don't think that any of them were portrayed in a way that, affected them, you know, their their offer or, or whatever. I do think that the fight in season one mm. affected all of them. And I don't know that the all of that would have happened if we had not had a film crew. I think I think there was a little bit of cockiness on our part, on and off the field, mm. because we had a film crew. And we were gonna be on a Netflix show. Mm. And I think whether or not I don't know that we knew it. I don't, but I think there was a little bit of that. We had a little bit of a chip um, from the fact that Netflix was doing a TV show about us, and I think that that probably showed on the field, and then it angered other teams. Mm -hmm. You know, and we were already look. We had already won three national championships. We were already beating the stew out of everybody. I mean, like everybody had every reason in the book to hate us anyway, and now we're on Netflix. Like, come on. And so I, I think that that. There was buildup to that fight, and I don't know that that buildup would have been there without the cameras. And I think the fight dramatically affected all of them. Hmm. I mean, I think there wasn't a single person on that team that wasn't affected by that fight, I think. Yeah. I mean, that, that you're talking about people not getting offers at all. Because of that fight, you're talking about us losing three games on our schedule and and three games where people would have gotten film and maybe would have gotten recruited. I mean, you know, it just there was just so much encapsulated in that fight that affected you know all of them. Yeah, I mean, massive ones for everybody, really. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of just life and choices and and just the situations we find ourselves in. But that's interesting. I mean, just one of those things like you. Yeah. Would it have been different if, like you were yeah. saying, like had I said no, would, how would my life be oh, different? Oh, yeah. Well, I think, they're... you know, look, you look at, well, uh, you know, like Ronald Ali, I mean, obviously he's 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 famous. I mean, people love him and everybody mm-hmm. loves him. And, and there wasn't a negative word said about that kid, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, everybody loves him. And, and I think, you know, that's certainly been a benefit to him in his in his life. At the same time, when you're thrown into that overnight, like, you're not expecting it. It's not what you signed up to. None of us signed up to be famous, you know. Like, we signed up to play. They signed up to play football. I signed up to do a job. And then all of a sudden. And when you're catapulted into that overnight instant success with social media. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, it changes you. Yeah. And I think for them, a lot of them, I barely had the skill set to deal with it, all of it. I mean, I barely did. I, I struggle with, like, how did they get through that? Mm-hmm. Because I don't, I mean, the amount of people pulling on you and, like, wanting stuff and then the just the, even the amount of praise. Mm-hmm. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I always, like, social media is great. It's got, you know, we understand it has great connectivity and there's fantastic benefits. But I do not think the human mind is meant to calculate that much interaction with other human beings. Agree. That much like you're saying, praise or criticism or, criticism or whatever, that someone else's opinion is able to get to me. Oh, yeah. That I can't, I don't have the capacity to file that away and categorize that correctly without that starting to, you're hearing voices that you, should, you shouldn't even be exposed to right, that. Right, You're accepting criticism from somebody that you wouldn't even accept advice from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and while that's a fantastic principle, it makes perfect sense if you're able to, to keep that in mind while things are coming at you. But that's hard to do. It is hard to do. Because, I mean, I mean, we all know, like, you get 50 positive messages, and then there's the one. Well, which one, which one oh, do you yeah. think about for the next six hours? It's the one. Yeah. It's stupid, but that's what you're thinking mm-hmm. about. So, And I'm like, we're not meant to do this. This is a stranger. These are all strangers. I shouldn't know any of this information. Yeah. 
But that's what social media is yeah. allowed. And we had no help. You know, we didn't mm-hmm. have, you know, you take a, look, I mean, you take the, the kids off of Stranger Things, who our shows came out at the exact same time. So <laughs> we were doing all of our press interviews and all of our media interviews in Hollywood and New York with the cast of Stranger Things. Like, staying in the same, my, my child was swimming in the pool with those kids. And they were kids, and yeah. now they're, like, grown people. But we, <laughs> but you take them Well, they had, they were actors and actresses and they had agents and they had handlers and they had PR reps Mm -hmm. that were navigating for them how to handle the fact that they were about to be on a hit show on Netflix. Like when that show blew up, they had a team of people saying, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Do this. Give me your phone. I'll take over your social media. We had nobody. Right. And so we're going through the same thing at the same time time they were going through it and actually at one point our numbers were beating their numbers Mm. and we had nobody and the criticism we didn't have a team we didn't have we had nothing the criticism coming at you is personal even more well well i'm sure it's always personal it doesn't but but as an actor or an actress like when you're doing that like this is a character you play so i feel like there's a there's a a at least a degree of separation to it's still your art for sure but if i'm going to critique what i saw on on Netflix with you, it's going to be you I'm attacking. Yeah. What you said, what you what you thought about that. And I think that yeah. elevates everything to a, oh, gosh, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Was that was that the right move? Right. You know? Should I tweet this out? Is this in line with the brand of sweet, motivating Britney? Or can and I be true to myself today and be pissed off about something? Right. You know, there's the whole – and, and – You know, you're talking about me being in my 40s and navigating it. And then you've got Ronald Ollie and John Franklin and all these guys who were 18, 19, 20. And they're navigating it. And I mean. I don't know how. I mean, that is a spoken like an older person. But you you start looking at the generations that are this has become. I mean, I still remember like not having that. Yeah. I think that kind of allows you to stay a little grounded sometimes. Yeah. Uh, or it's easier to, to grab hold of that. But I, it's really concerning. Just if we're just going to talk mental health yeah. of the next generations that are coming up that don't know any different than right. it's born with mom, and dad, and the voice on the internet and the influence of yeah. this outside that doesn't care about you. No. You know, there, there's no. <laughs> there's no concern of whether that right. lands well or not or that no. you you move on and, you know, can get past whatever you're struggling with. It's like this this will eat you up, spit you out, it does not care. Yeah. It is. There was a time where, you know, when all this first started happening, I had 171 Twitter followers the day before the show came out. I had a private account. It was locked, you know, and I had 171 followers and I think I had 117 on Instagram. All my accounts were private. My Facebook friends were actually my friends. Like I only had like 400 people that were Facebook friends with me because I took it so seriously. Like I was like, you want to follow me? I don't know you. Decline. And then all of a sudden Netflix is like, you can't do that like up. you're gonna have to open everything up right. publicly if you don't want to open, you're gonna have to have a fan page you're gonna have to have all and I'm like what and I remember having going to bed that night and having 171 followers and waking up the next morning in LA the night the show dropped and 24 hours after the show dropped having 10,000 and being like what the heck mm-hmm. you know and at first I'm, I'm checking it every five minutes <laughs> And it's like, ooh, in five minutes it went to 10,010. And then, ooh, and now it's at 10,500. And you're just checking it constantly. Yep. And then, and you're. It's like they built that to be psychologically. Oh, uh, it's a disaster. <laughs> they know exactly what they were doing. Yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, and you're looking at like everybody else's, because you have all your notifications. Anytime anybody says my name, you know, I'm going to get the alert that someone tweeted about Brittany Wagner. And then you're reading it all. And then you're liking it or you're commenting or you're retweeting. And it's like, you're just consumed mm-hmm. in the beginning, you know? Mm-hmm. And and if there was an hour where I wasn't increasing by a thousand followers, it's like, what happened? Like, why aren't people watching it? Why still? I need to tweet something because I'm losing interest. And that's nuts. Yeah. It is insanity that, like, that, that that takes hold in your brain and becomes so quickly normal. Yeah. That that is how you think. And then you talk to people and it's, you're not alone. Oh, no. We've all adopted this oh, new no. way of thinking about how we oh, interact yeah. with society. And now we have companies that prey on that. And so they can, you can pay them and they will increase your followers by whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. Right. Like, w- and what does this, 
mean? Because here's the thing. As fast as I gain those followers, I will lose them. Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) as fast as they clicked follow, they will click unfollow. And it's just interesting. Like, you know, I've watched the number. I tweeted out, I've tweeted out something and watched 4,000 followers go like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, it's like you you have to decide at some point, like, how much do I care? Yeah. And and that's that's a process for sure, because like you just ex- described the 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 addiction to the to the chemical like pleasure, whatever that you're right. getting like, oh, this is this stimulating. This is fun. And people are interested in me. I mean, but but <laughs> yeah. initially, that's, yeah. that's that's what, what you're you feeling. Think. Yeah. And as humans, we're built to kind of yeah. like that. That gets our attention. Yeah. But yet, if you want to be effective, I think, one, those numbers mean nothing. Right. Yeah. But if you want to be effective, like, you can't let chasing those numbers or the comfort in those numbers mean anything to you. You have to figure out, like, what am I, what, what is my voice? What am I trying to yeah. do? And, and stay so sent. And what if, what if everyone says you're wrong? It's like, okay, well, no, I've done the work. I've yeah. thought about what I want yeah. what my message is, what, what my core values, what my beliefs are, what, what I don't compromise on. And I've only been doing this six years with like social media and it's nothing, nothing like what you're dealing with at all. <laughs> but I think, but, but the basics are, or the, the mental like gymnastics you have to go through is still the same where if Absolutely. you don't hold on to that, like, okay, Absolutely. what am I? Then those numbers can go, come, yeah. disappear. At this it doesn't point, matter. I could give, I could give a lot of dirty words. Like <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I, I mean, it's great. Yeah. The blue check mark's great. Well, I and and there is again, there is a great part of social media. It is great to to influence and to, and to get a message where someone is inspired by something. Oh yeah. And yeah, I yeah. made a decision because I watched this or I saw this. And and back to that initial point you made is. When those moments happen, it's not, wow, Jillian's amazing. Look what she did. She's, she's influencing people. I'm so good at this. It's no, it's, wow, we're, I'm living in a way that's true to what I wanted, who I am, and I'm able to share it with people. Yeah. But that's what we all should be doing. Yes. Is we should be like influencing, having conversations, encouraging each other. And yes. we don't do enough of that. We don't yeah. stop people. We love to criticize, but we don't grab people and go, hey, you're doing a good job. Right. This is amazing. Thank you for doing that. That means a lot. We all have the capacity to do that with each other. And yet we, I don't know if we're lazy or we just, I don't know what's wrong I with I think us it sometimes. makes us feel better to put other people down. So, oh, and that's just based out of that insecurity. Yeah. In order to feel good about ourselves, you know, people, um, you know, when people criticize me, people always ask me, like, do you do you tweet them back? You know, like, do you message them and, like, yell at them? You know, like, mm-hmm. when people say nasty things to you on, on social media. And I'm like, no, honestly, like, A, I, I blo- I'm a block and deleter. And so at this point, six years into the game, five years into the game, there's really not a whole lot of people that follow me that, that don't think I'm great because I've blocked and deleted all of the ones <laughs> that didn't because I just don't have, I don't want to know. I don't care. I don't, you know, and like, I don't need, I don't need that negativity just constantly in my face because it mm. is what I will focus on. Mm. It is. And so I just block and delete and I'm just like, Meh. but Brene Brown is an art, a writer that I love. And she always says like, it's, it's not the critic that counts. You know, it's the person in the arena fighting the fight that counts. Mm-hmm. And so if you're constantly listening to the critics, if you're constantly listening to the people that say, like, you're not doing that right or you don't look like this or you're not, why do you care? Mm-hmm. Like, if they're not actually fighting your fight and living your life, like, what what do they have to say? They're not doing it. And I think, you know, and I always, when people criticize, I don't ever respond to a negative anything because you're not going to talk someone out of their beliefs <laughs> over social media. That's I mean, political you know, arguments not aren't like how... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, no. So whatever. I just read it, and I'm like, okay, move on. But I, my first thought is, what has happened to you in your life mm. to make you this angry or critical or negative or sad? Like, like what are you going through? Because it has to be horrible. Or it has to have been horrible for you to have created a social media account that you don't, you don't use your name, you don't put a picture, and the sole purpose of that account is to put other people down. That's the only reason it exists, is for you to knock p- other people down. What, what happened life. to you? What a life. Yeah. What a, what, to be in that, in that mind. 
that yeah. like that's what you live in every day that that's that's where you find joy and pleasure is doing that yeah and why yeah. and like that's where my brain goes yeah. it's like i wonder what has happened to that person because that's so sad well and again on a smaller level but same thing where i i, I years ago um i had the choice it was um i got kind of a little bit more public and got got things about my physical appearance that i did not i did not he hadn't even thought of my own self so it was like Oh, that was a new one. I didn't. I didn't. Now I get that to think about when yeah, I get insecure. Right, so that yeah. was that was fun, and I remember how much that damaged me because it was like I don't know these people, yeah. and you you're this angry, you're this hateful towards someone you don't know, and it just hurt my feelings. And and I remember like getting a lot of advice from other people, and it was like, well, you have two choices. You're public. You can get off. You don't have to be on social media. Yeah, you have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> Or, well, unless you're working with Netflix, and I tell you. <laughs> That's different. Uh, but it, for my decisions, yeah. it was like, well, you can get off or you can choose to, you know, just not engage. This is just, that's, yeah. you need to put the right perspective on these things and just not engage. And from that moment on, I I do not engage with negativity yeah. at all. But also adopting the mindset you just spoke about where taking that, like, it does say more about the individual yeah. than it, it's not me you're coming after. This is this is a you problem. And that has allowed for compassion yeah. that I have chosen to lean into. So when I get a, an extra nasty one, it's like I have to go through that process and then actually find myself going, wow, I can't, that person woke up and that felt like a good decision, what they did. Mm -hmm. And I don't, that's an awful yeah. way to be in life. How can you how could you be successful if you're so brought down by someone else's path someone that or, they don't even know. Yeah, and so I've I've loved yeah. that there's been a compassion side for the way my mind has worked with that because it really did, it's like I don't have like enemies and critics and I am able to kind of just be like no, they're just broken people. Yeah. That I wish yeah. you well. I wish there was some way for me to actually connect with you because I think if we sat down and had a conversation, yeah. maybe we could right this ship in some way. But that's not – obviously, that's not a job yeah. any of us can do. No, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I think that's why we live in a state right now in the world where there, there aren't compassionate people and there's not a lot of empathy. Like, we want everything to be about us, mm -hmm. you know. And so then – and then we're going to fight. We're going to fight for ourselves. When it's not even about us, it's not about us. It has nothing to the criticism. It has nothing to do with me. You know why it has nothing to do with me? Because you don't even know me, right? It but we're can't. not. We, you know, we're such a society of like narcissists, and it's like everything's about me, and like, and and then so then we're just angry at everybody else for not thinking what we want them to think. Mm -hmm. Well, how about stepping back from that whole philosophy and thinking that it's nothing's really about you? And then I think when we're able to do that, we're able to step back and go. Oh, wow, this isn't about me. This is about you, and you're a product of your experiences. And wow, those experiences must have been really hard. How can we help the next generation of people that are in those experiences not experience that so that they're not like you? Mm -hmm. But we we can't get there for some reason. And yeah. and we, we and I think that's how empathy exists. You know, that's how compassion exists when you're able to take yourself out of it and step back from a situation and go, Oh wow! What can I do to change that narrative? You know, and and I don't know what it what where the block is of of us as a society not being able to step away from the narcissism and <laughs> well, we've embraced so many things in our lives. I think that just cultivate narcissism. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, and I mean, I I know we all love to go after social media. It's here. I, I don't, Absolutely. and I think that's probably part of the problem is that like I don't how do we fix it? It's like, okay, well, I'm going to get off social media. And it's like, well, that doesn't fix the problem because we're watching, you know, right. millions and millions of people participate in this, on these platforms. You know, for me, I always say it when I go out and speak and, you know, you're speaking to a room full of people and you're supposed to be the person on the stage that's supposed to motivate and inspire people. And, you know, you walk in and you're like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're trying, I'm in my hotel room, like trying to motivate screwed. and inspire myself. Cause I'm like really thinking like, <laughs> you know, no point in trying here folks. But you know, I think that like, it's one person at a time. Mm. And when you go into any situation where you're looking at, I've got to change 100 point of views, or I've got to change, you know, I've got to change this whole community. I've got to change this whole school, this whole student body. 
it ain't happening. Mm. It's not happening. But if you can go into it th- th- with the mindset of like, okay, in a room full of 10 people, if I can change one person's opinion on one thing, we get the ball rolling. Mm. You know, and if that's maybe the goal of like, it's just, it's one moment at a time. It's one person at a time. It's one belief. It's one thought at a time. It's one habit or goal at a time. Mm -hmm. That's doable. Mm -hmm. That is doable. And it does get the ball rolling. And that is how change is affected Mm -hmm. one person at a time. Yeah. You know, and I mean, in all the work that I've done, I, I can't, there's no way, I'm not a miracle worker. I can't go into a school and take an athlete that's 18 years old and, and like completely change his entire existence <laughs> in four years or two years or six months or whatever. There's no, nobody can do that. But what I can do is say, okay, look at it, look at a, a kid, look at their situation, look at where they've come from and then say, okay, if we can change these three habits or if we can change these three things, we got a shot. But if you look at the whole picture, I don't know. Maybe there's a person out there, but I haven't met them yet that, no, you know, I think, that yeah. can do it and can stay motivated themselves through the process to do it. Right. Because it's daunting. There's, it like, is. It would just yeah. it would swallow you whole, I think. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, with the – obviously the – the show and the success of the show, and then I'm sure the, the learning process of going through the show. I would feel like maybe, and maybe I'm wrong, going through that process. While I, you are very organized and you, you're methodical oh, yeah. in, in the way type you type A for sure. <laughs> no way is, around it. I mean, you. I don't think you could do your job without kind of having that yeah. type of yeah. uh, of an organized mind in that sense. But you came out of this. Did did you feel like it fine tuned you? Because it kind of. With a camera there, well, I know you were being you, and that was there was yeah. no, there was no character. But I think when there's yeah. someone watching it, you yeah. know that you need to. I'm gonna be intentional about what I'm saying right now. Or, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I did that help finds... with the book? Like where then you kind of were were mapping out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this show fine tuned me for sure. I do think I was more thought thoughtful in what I said and did while I was on camera. It was always in the back of my mind. Not that I thought millions of people would watch it, but I thought my dad would watch it. Mm. (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) you you know, that was in the back of my mind. My dad and my child. You know, I knew that at some point she would watch the show, Mm. you know, and is she going to be proud of me or is she going to be embarrassed or is she going to be mortified Mm. because I have a choice. And and look, we don't have to be on TV (laughs) to have that choice every day. But – um, with the book, I feel like I, I want it to be less fine tuned for the book. Okay. I, th- what's the point in writing a book where I'm trying to make other people open up themselves and get vulnerable with themselves and be honest with themselves if I'm not going to do it myself? And, and I felt like if I'm going to write the book, I can't lie. Like I can't be fake and I can't just be like it's all sunshine and rainbows and if you believe it you can become it and if you (laughs) you know and so I just was like I have to be honest in this book and so I think I was a little less fine-tuned in the book I think my editors and publishers reined it in a little bit Mm. like they were a little bit like oh you know like you sure you want to say that or or if you once you put this out Mm -hmm. you know everybody's gonna know it And if I had had, you know, I think that comes down to publishing. If I had a different publishing company that, like, wanted more of the tell-all, I think the book would be a little bit different. Because the the first manuscript I wrote was a little bit rougher, a little Mm -hmm. bit more raw, probably, and a little bit less fine-tuned. Well, I thought it was a beautiful balance because I wasn't expecting – I mean, I I really came into this blind. I had watched the show, but I was like, okay, I don't don't have any other context for anything else. Um, and I got the title, and because the title somewhat relates to the show, I kind of just made some assumptions, and I was like, okay, well, let's let's get into this. But I loved that it was – it's your story, like, yes. inter- interwoven through the, this, the same principles that we saw implemented with these kids, but it's it, – you just – you made it more human. You made it more pal- – it's – we saw it in this context, but it's palatable for everybody. Yes. And then – and you made it, it real for everybody. Yeah, so. yeah. Because I think so many of those things that those students were going through, so many of the lessons that I was trying to teach them have nothing to do with football. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and pe- people want to make it about it's a football show and it's about – no, it's not. Mm. Like every lesson in there can be applied to 
life, you know, no matter what you're doing, no matter how old you are, no matter where you live, I mean, all the things, like it can be applied. And so that was really the goal is like, how do I take concepts from a football show and make it relate, cross over to everybody? And really it wasn't, it was the fans of the show that kind of showed me that I could Mm. because I would get emails from a 40 year old guy in Germany who would say like, oh my gosh, I'm the biggest fan and watching you made me go back to college and finish my degree. Mm -hmm. Like you made me believe that I could do it. And, or, you know, I would get emails from a 70 year old man, uh, you know, or a 12 year old girl. I mean, I I was getting thousands of emails a day from people and no two people were the same. (laughs) I mean, and it was like, how, how did we inspire a 24-year-old football player while also inspiring a 52-year-old single mom who lives in Iowa. Mm. Like, how did that happen? But it did. And so it was. it were the emails that I was getting constantly that really made me see, like, okay, this crossed over. Like, people are relating to this that have never touched a football or have never watched a football game. So how can I, how can I put this in writing and make it continue to cross over. And and that was really the goal. And I could not do that without putting myself in the story and being honest. Yeah. You know, and you think about like my story alone. I mean, being from Mississippi, the poorest state in the country, having a psychologist as a father, a special education teacher as a mother who got divorced when I was in college, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life until my advisor made me do it. And then my advisor told me, you can't do that because you're a girl doing it anyway. I mean, then being in this man's field and fighting my way through all of it, take getting married, having a baby, my husband has an affair, I leave, take this baby by myself. I mean, it, the whole story, it's like, you know, I go to scuba, then I'm on a Netflix show, my life gets flipped upside down because I'm all of a sudden famous. You know, nobody really knows about my life. And there's that fear of like, is everyone going to figure out Mm -hmm. that I have, I'm the master of relationships, but I have, I've been divorced and failed miserably at one. Mm -hmm. Like, what is people going to say when they figure that out? I've been single now for 10 years. Like, does that not completely contradict everyone's belief about Miss Wagner? That imposter thing. Yeah. It's all of that. What you think It's all of that. People think I'm millionaire. And when they find out I'm broke as a joke and have worked my butt off for every dime I have or well, people's opinion. I mean, it was all of that. But knowing that like all of that is real and that's what, I mean, you know, look, how many women have had been cheated on and picked up their lives and made the decision to go and get out of the relationship and fight for themselves. Mm -hmm. Millions. Well, why, you know, like, why should I not tell that story? And so I think, you know, I made the decision to do it. And then, of course, as you're writing it, you're like, oh, God, why did I – what am I doing? You know, I, like, why am I-, I thought about that. I'm like, oh, man. I just kind of like for a second was like, what if I wrote a book one day? And I was like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. getting over those hurdles of – I mean, you were very vulnerable on the show and then took it to another level. Yeah. And and, and you can't take it back. <laughs> no, it's out there forever. It's in black and white. It is. It is. And it's okay. It's okay. Well, but I don't is it, do you it find all. that there's been freedom each of those steps? Yeah. Like the more, the more, when honesty is like the clarifier it for is. everything. It is. It, honesty and owning it. Mm. Just owning it. You know, I, there was there were moments when the show came out that I would I would cry in my bed and think like, what if everybody finds out this X? You know, or what if what if you know everybody hates me? Or what if? This person gets mad at me and calls and tells everybody my deepest and darkest secrets. You know, I mean, there's all of that that goes through your mind. Like, mm-hmm. look, a lot of famous people have been taken down by some by somebody or something they did or what, you know, and there's all of that that, you know, and especially when you've walked away from an income where you're now betting on your name. Yeah. There's a lot of fear in what if my name is no longer good? Mm-hmm. Then what am I going to do? You know, I mean, there's a lot of that. But I would lay there and think to myself, well, if it's true, then you just own it. Because if you tell your own story and you own that it's true and then you tell the story, nobody else owns the narrative anymore. Like, you own it. And so I just would lay there and talk myself out of the panic attack, you know, by saying, like, look, 
I'll, just own the truth. All you'll do, Brittany, if if and when any of this happens, is you'll own the truth. Mm-hmm. And you and and there will be people that like you, and there will be people that hate you, and it'll be fine. Yeah. You just keep going. And it's easier said from the point that I sit, <laughs> right. where most people love me and think I'm the greatest human to have ever walked the planet for some reason. I mean, it's really easy for me to say it from where I sit, but I think that that's just what has to happen. I, I think mean, that's what keeps you sane. And I, and I think it's a process, too. It's not something you do once and it, it no. covers you for eternity. I think it is it is something that, like, once you make the realization, now the practice is implementing this mindset constantly. The next challenge that comes yeah. up is going to rock your world. It's going to make you feel yep. unstable. You're going to have to go through the feeling again. You're going to feel it all. You're going to yep. experience it. And then you're going to have to remember that that narrative or that 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 That's voice worrying, that I yeah. need to grab a hold of and that needs to come back in yeah. and then, okay, now we move forward again. Yeah. Yeah. It, it takes practice and right. We'll get it right before we die. Like, we'll be yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Because I'm just figured out like three quarters of it, and I feel like I'm like, hmm. That's the weird Great. The realization where you just are like, oh man, I'm just gonna figure it out. That's how it's gonna be. I'm just gonna start to feel like I got this, and then yeah. like my body's gonna be like, we're done, we're done, <laughs> it's over. <laughs> Car crash next. I mean, really, it's like, why, why couldn't I, if I had figured out half of this when I was thirty? Mm-hmm. Oh man, it would, yeah. Like you mean my, my but, you mean the relationships I'm in have to do with my picker? Like you mean <laughs> wait wait time out. You mean the fact <laughs> that I date really crappy men? I chose them. Oh wow, that's eye opening. <laughs> I don't want to believe that. I thought that it was because <laughs> you were crappy. My bad. Well, and, but uh, <laughs> you're I get you've shared this process with the public, and I think. That sharing that process, like you said in the beginning, is if we turn and we we inspire or we expose what we're struggling with and how we what we figured out with each other, yeah. that's the journey. And and we don't do that enough. And I think that's why we're seeing the problems. We're not we're not human to human anymore. I don't see your faults because I keep everything. I'm perfect. I'm perfect. This is my yeah. Instagram, I'm and I'm perfect, and yeah. it's everything's good. And yeah. by not being vulnerable we are like we're just we're ruining society yeah by not being real with each other because now no one has the tools because no one i'm the only one right i'm depressed now because there is no one like no one's dealing with this and i think the the reality is we're a lot more similar than we are different and it's amazing how you you have an honest conversation with somebody and it's like oh we think exactly the same way yeah 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 i always say when i talk to college students you're comparing your worst moment mm. of the day, your worst day, to somebody else's filtered, fake, happiest shot. Yeah. I mean, how many Christmas card photos does a family take? Hundreds. And the dog's crying and the kids are crying and the hair's a mess and somebody hits somebody and then the, it starts raining and now we're all set. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a process and it's horrible. It's like the two worst days of your life will be Christmas card photo taking <laughs> day and like, I don't know, back to school day maybe. But like we take all these pictures and then which one are we going to put on the card? Yeah. The absolute best shot. And then that's not even good enough anymore because now we're going to run it through and we're going to put a filter over it. Mm-hmm. And we're going to make, and we're going to Photoshop everybody, and I'm going to be skinnier, and this person's going to, and we're going to all be perfect, and we're going to mail it out to everybody we know. this is who we are. Because this is who we are. Yeah. When it's not at all who we are. And then I get the Christmas card, and I'm on my floor crying (laughs) because everyone on my refrigerator is perfect, and I'm not. Yeah. But the reality is, like, all of the makings of all of this was fake. But you get kids nowadays who are depressed, alone, didn't get invited to the party, in their bed, they pick up their Instagram, and what do they see? They see the best photo from the party where everyone's happy and smiling and everyone looks perfect and everyone's in the latest and greatest outfit, and they've got 300 likes, and I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But what you didn't see was, you know, all the fights and all the drama and all the... You didn't see all the stuff leading up to it, Mm -hmm. you know, and and it's not real. None of it's real. And we know this. We we know it. We know it intellect, but it's just, it's, yeah, we're just not, we're not giving ourselves the time or or, or just decided to bypass that thought process of of looking at it logically. We get emotionally caught up with, I don't have an answer for this. It affects our self-esteem. Absolutely. It affects our, it becomes our self-worth. 
we attach our self worth and our value to to what to the comparison mm-hmm. to everybody else's perfection that isn't you, even real. This is off tangent. I'm just thinking. I mean, I grew up in the the era of um, self esteem was pumped into like my generation. Like it was like we had to build up your self esteem. It was. I just remember that was a big thing. And I remember hearing like, no, we all think really well of ourselves already. It's not like a <laughs> self esteem issue. You don't need to be like. And, and of course, there are certain instances where there are things that people are dealing with where that is the case. But as a whole, no, we all think pretty highly of ourselves. Do you think we got off track by like trying to make sure everyone had great self-esteem and think about your and like it became too inward looking? And instead of like looking outside of, I don't know if like looking. I, I, maybe I don't know. This is I, all going to be edited out I'm because sure I makes any sense. Feel like there was the generation, you know, a huge stretch of generations where feelings weren't talked about. Like everything was suppressed. Just mm. smile and suck it up, you know. And I don't think that's healthy. I right. think that then spawned the generation, like you know, has spawned mm. some issues in future generations. And then there became the generation of, like, you're the greatest thing that ever existed. And even though you finished 10th place, we're going to give you a trophy and a ribbon and act like you won the whole thing. And I don't think that's healthy either. Because now we have a generation of people that don't understand work ethic. Yeah. And they think everybody's just going to hand them something. And they're going to get a ribbon. Or they're going to get a paycheck. Or they're going to get... And that most of the time, success is hard. Wait a minute. Success is hard work. Right. And so I think there's a middle ground there. Maybe we just balance. We just swing. Right. And I think there should be a balance. Like, you know, Mm -hmm. there's somewhere in the middle is where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you are great. Yes, you can do this. However, (laughs) you have feelings, feel them and move on. However, you have to work hard to get what you want in life like nobody's going to hand you anything and then when even if even if you are of that top one percent where yes maybe people are going to hand you things the platform doesn't equal success the thing doesn't equal success it will be what you do with it you know and I I talk about that in the book and I talk about it when I speak but like the you know the platform doesn't equal success I mean I mean the I, I could sit at my desk and go okay well when this show comes out there were a lot of people on that show, and there were about two of us that have capitalized off of it. Mm-hmm. You know why? We were the two that were willing to work. I mean, you can get the NFL. You, you can sign to play in the NFL. You know how many people get cut? A whole lot. You know how many people are on a Major League Baseball roster and you don't know their name? A whole lot. Mm-hmm. Why? Work ethic. Mm-hmm. Like, at some point, the, you know, the talent is going to equal out, and it's going to come down to who's willing to work hard. Yeah. I mean, the job title, you know, you go get, we all think like, well, when I get this job title or when I get this amount of money or when I get this Netflix show or when I get this, then I'm going to sit back and put my feet up. That's never the case. It doesn't happen. Life isn't like that. And so, you know, I think success comes to the people that are willing to work for it. And I don't think that work ever stops. Mm -hmm. And I think that's outward work and I think it's inward work. Right. I think success also, true success, also comes, sustainable success, also comes to the people that are willing to adapt, to mold, to change, to grow, to be better. Mm -hmm. Because eventually society is going to change. And if you're still sitting there with your arms crossed, you know, throwing your little temper tantrums because we now have to hire women or we now have to do this or we now have to do that, I mean, you're you're going (laughs) to, you're not going to, you're going to age out. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's like the platform or the person, both, you have to be willing to work on both in yeah. order to actually ch- achieve sustainable success. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. Um, well, I wanted to talk because you have some fun stuff in here. So, you know, the show and the book and the release of the book, but you, you've you gotten to experience uh, because of all these these things that have happened in your yeah. life that I think are, I don't they're fun. They're, you, wh- what's the status of your, there was a, a a script that was written or a movie yeah. that was created with you, you as the star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were going to make a, they are, they making a movie or they were going to, or what, who what's, knows? Okay. So it's one of those. It's Hollywood. Gotcha. Um, no, there was a, a TV show, a scripted TV series in okay. the making. 
Um, Michael Strahan was one of the producers of it. He's the one that kind of, his production company is the one that kind of got it going. Okay. He's a huge fan of Last Chance You. Um, and so he got Courtney Cox on board to play me in this show. Okay. Um, and so, And they give some, yeah. they have a, a page in your book, which I noticed, right? They do. <laughs> they uh, promoted, helped promote. That's and, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supported, they've pretty much supported everything I've done, which is crazy. That's, well, that, crazy. That's great, And amazing. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we were well on our way. Script was written. Um, we were, we were moving forward. We had gone to LA and done all the pitches to all the mm-hmm. networks and gotten a deal and like it was we had done what we thought was the hard part and everything was good to go and just like life you mm-hmm. know COVID hits because <laughs> right when things might work out for Brittany Wagner like right <laughs> when right when it's like oh I'm finally going to actually be compensated yeah. like this compensation will then like all of the things are going to be compensated with this one thing, and I'm about to have this show, and I'm a producer on it, and, like, finally. All of the tears would be worth it. Finally. Yeah. I might can sit back and just be like, oh, this is awesome. And just sit in your success. Sit in my success mm-hmm. that I have all of a sudden started thinking I wasn't going to have to work for. Mm-hmm. COVID hits. And Hollywood shuts down, and thousands of scripts are tabled. And so then we wait and we wait and we wait. And in the process of waiting, other things happen in the world, you know. And and, um, and next thing we know, you know, Hollywood takes forever to get, get back up and running. And then when they get back up and running, there's all these scripts that, mm-hmm. you know, and there's – it's like picking and choosing and throwing out and doing whatever. Well, we were still on the table and had to change some things. Um, and so we – got some new writers and kind of went in and we were kind of revamping some things thinking like this is going to be a lot later than we expected but it's still coming it's coming mm-hmm. and um yeah and i don't know okay <laughs> cuz it was all like good and then all of a sudden you know when you start getting ghosted you know yeah and then you're like yeah he doesn't like me anymore <laughs> yeah i know what this means when Courtney cox is getting ghosted by a network Okay. When her agent isn't getting returned phone calls, you're like, mm, they're done. So I don't know. It's still there. And I hear, you know, people tell me stories all the time of like, you know, my script sat there for how many every years and then all of a sudden, you know, it's still there and we'll see. But I mean, yeah. Uh, and not to, <laughs> I mean, you're in it. So it, I, I want to be sensitive because when you're in it, it's kind of like, oh, this is uncomfortable. But it's like. Yeah. Your story has kind of had these moments where it's oh, like, it is. I thought that's where we were complete going. Complete in line with my story. Yeah, complete. And, I mean, but if we're honest, that's life for a lot of us, and it maybe is. not at a level where we're having a movie made about or a, a television yeah. show made about ourselves. But like w- these moments where you're like, oh, that's it. That's where I'm going. All of yeah. this work that that makes sense. Okay, wow, it's happening. Oh, that it's you're happening. pulling the rug out from under me. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. I've been here before. Yeah, it's just like, it's like the. Story, and I guess you're right. Probably everybody does experience it on some level. That's, yeah, uh, you know, and, and and the other kind of truth, I guess, that I just had like an aha moment was usually right after that big disappointment, something great happens. It, yeah. So I just had the big disappointment. So that means something great is happening. <laughs> that's so exciting. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, it it's life, and I, if you you got to take a step back. It just it's. Don't take life so personally. I don't know. Sometimes that, that uh, this is me speaking to myself. It's and that's hard to do for sure. Yeah. But well. like you just kind of got to be like, you're you're not the I'm not the only human being out there, and it, no. and it could be worse. Oh it well, could. that's where I go with my self talk is, uh, Brittany, you went to Courtney Cox's house, and you've hung out with Michael and Courtney, and you now have all these connections because of all of this and you got to see how a TV show is made and you were in it because you were a producer on it and you did get paid, you know, sums of money for the whole process and you've had all of this box of experiences because this TV show was going to get made. Where's your gratitude, girl? (laughs) Because, I mean, those experiences in and of itself... If you had told me even five years ago, even after Last Chance You had come out, if you had said, you're, you're going to experience this, I would have been like, no, right. there's no way right. this girl is getting invited to 
a weekend at Courtney Cox's house. Like, that ain't happening. You know, I mean, it, it, and, and and not even just, like, to form, to be a friend, to be friends with her. Like, to form a relationship and get to know her and realize that she's an incredible human being mm-hmm. and Strahan and, like, just those, like, all of those experiences, you know, yes, I can be sad and disappointed about the show, but I can be sad and disappointed for 24 hours. Yeah. And then I need to... <laughs> Be grateful for the fact that I'm even in the space to have that opportunity and experience. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's about the experience, I think. It is. It's just moving through the experience. It is. And successes will come and go. Yeah. But it's, it's and what you learn from the experience, yeah. you know, what you learn, what to do, what not to do. Like, it's just all, it's just, it's, and all of that is life, mm-hmm. which, mm-hmm. ah. You know, <laughs> it's hard. Well, it's not the huge paycheck in the, like, I've, again, you don't sit in success. That's not how it works. You want to no. hit the end of your life. And I'm like, I went for everything. I went and did it. Didn't always work out. But man, this is the life I got to live. Oh. Look at the story. I mean, and you got, this is a very small, you've got a whole lot of life ahead of you. And like, yeah. there's, yeah. there's more to be written. So like, maintain this, this mentality and we're going to go for it and hope for things. And sometimes we'll be disappointed. Mm-hmm. And that's. And we'll, and we'll move on. And we'll move on. So where, where, what are you doing now? Like, what is your, what is your, day, what does a day look like for you? Oh, gosh. I mean, a day look for me, it's not that, I get up super early to work out because I can't, that's the only time I have. And I box. It's crazy. You're, are you, you're boxing? Like, I'm a, yeah. A boxer. I'm a boxer, which is okay. Not- I know that you didn't see that coming, right? I didn't. You didn't see that coming in the same way you didn't see me walking out of East Mississippi Community College. I don't know how that happened either. Crazy. I walked in a boxing studio one day in Birmingham, Alabama. I'd never hit anything my entire life because in my family, you, my dad's a psychologist. It was like we talk about everything, but you turn the other cheek, girl, and like don't ever. Mm. And so I walk in this boxing gym and put these gloves on, and I punch this bag. And I mean, like 15 minutes in, I was like a weeping ball of mess on the floor because it was like all of these emotions that I had never really (laughs) let out in that way were coming out. And it was nutso for me. Like it was mentally nutso for me to hit something like that and just get it all out Mm. Um, in a private space, really. I mean, it's dark. You know, these boxing gyms are dark with neon lights, loud music. Like nobody can hear you. Nobody can see (laughs) you. So I wasn't. I wasn't on a stage in Bright Light. I was in a safe space just going at it, and I fell in love with it. And so I box every day pretty much. Now I'm a boxing coach. Okay. So I got, (laughs) you know, I can't do anything half-assed. So I decided, like, yeah, sure, I can coach boxing because, yeah, I'm 43. I was 42 at the time. I'm 42, and I, yeah, no problem. So I went through all the training and did all the things and about killed myself trying to become a boxing coach. <laughs> but I coach at this gym. There's two locations here in Birmingham. And um, I co- right now I, I coach about nine classes a week probably. And then I work out, you know, do, a, okay. do my own workouts too. So I love it. Like I'm like all in with all aspects of boxing. Now I'm not going to let anybody hit my face. Okay. That's that's where you draw the line. A little too so you're vain. Not in there and sp- a little too vain for that. Like I hit a bag, it doesn't punch back. I don't know. Nobody's hitting me. <laughs> no First sparring. time I get hit, no I'll be done. <laughs> but no, so I I do that, and then um, my daughter is is about to start high school. Okay. Yeah. How does that feel? Oh, uh, I feel really old. Okay. Well. <laughs> That wasn't where I was going. With that. <laughs> I meant, how does it feel with the the career you've had, with oh. like watching, kind of that demographic of, yeah. of kids? Ooh. Is, it's where you know it's a little worrisome. I I have complete and total confidence in her, though. Mm. I mean, I feel like she is an amazing person who's. It's just been the two of us for a long, long time, and um, I feel like she's got it. Mm. Like you got this, girl. Like go. It's the other people that I'm a little worried about. She's beautiful, like really beautiful. Um, yeah. So I, the boy, I don't know. We'll see. But it's ninth grade, you know, I'm still cool. <laughs> she still like kind of likes me. I'm not an idiot yet. Now I can't go anywhere with her. Like mm. if we go to a football game, she's like, "Mom, you have to go in, and then I'll go." Like we can't walk in together. That's awful. I'm like, "Okay, I got you." 
So it's like that whole thing. I have to navigate like when I'm cool and when I'm not cool because it varies. Um, but that's fun, and I'm an Uber driver for her. Okay. I mean, like, that's my role now. Like, I'm just an Uber <laughs> driver. She is not happy that I'm doing this today because she had plans. Oh, no. And her plans got wrecked because I was like, I'm gone, girl. I got things to do. Um, and then I still do. I do a lot of motivational speaking. Okay. Still um, all over the place, all over the country, virtually or in person, um, which I that's probably my favorite thing that I do right now because um, you can walk in a room of – I don't know, 100 people or 1,000 people, and you're it's a captive audience. Yeah. Like They can't leave, <laughs> or they can, I guess, but they don't. And then you can watch kind of the change. You know, you start to see people cry or start to see people's facial expressions, body language change, and it's just – I feel like when I walk in a room like that and, and do one of those speeches that I'm actually changing people. Yeah. A mass number of people at one in one moment, mm. which um, feels really good. So I still do that. And then now I've taken on a new role. I'm a college professor. Okay. Which well, I say that and then I have to like. Because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so like academic and I don't. Uh, what what type of a course or courses? So I'm doing? teaching in the business school um, of a local school here and they have a sports studies minor. Okay. So I teach um, sport marketing, sport management. Sport ethics, which is my favorite, mm. and another class, and I can't remember the name of it, but <laughs> sport something else. Um, and then I also teach a freshman class. So all the freshmen have to go through me, which I love, 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 love. Um, and it's like a life skills, like mm. it's my book, yeah, basically, that's awesome. like in a class. So it's, it's that's really cool. Yeah, it's I mean, fun. I. Oh, I love how that's morphed for you. That's, that's yeah. it's changing, and it's yeah. not you're not expecting any of this, and yet I, you're getting to implement all of that you've gone through in a new way and, and in a very effective way. Yeah, because I mean, that age to influence yeah. that is, I think that's yeah. so powerful, especially today. Yeah, like, it's fun to be back on a college campus. Like mm-hmm. I realized, I was missing that energy. I was missing like that. Look, because people, you know, are like, oh, what you did for those guys and you changed their lives and blah, blah, blah. But in reality, I mean, they changed mine, you know. Like in reality, I mean, there was – it was a two-way street there. I mean, they those guys taught me a lot. I changed a lot in the eight years that I was there because of them mm-hmm. and because of their experiences and because of their stories and um, because of the relationships that I had with them. And so I was missing that. Mm. Um, And to be back on a college campus and, like, you know, I haven't quite formed that yet, like, uh, that relationship or those bonds with students. But um, I will be an advisor, too, so I'll have the opportunity, you know, to counsel and and be kind of back in that setting. And it fills me up. That energy and that, I don't know, that thing that, that all of those young, naive, like, People that think they have it all figured out. <laughs> they know it all. Give you is something. <laughs> something. So I love it. So, yeah. But that's in a nutshell what I'm doing. Okay. I mean, I have, you know, I have all these little side hustles, I feel like. But, yeah. We're just taking advantage of the opportunity comes yeah. up. You go yeah. for it and yeah. see where it goes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I need to get you back to your Uber driving, you know, job. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up. handling it today. <laughs> my well, poor mom. If people want to, uh, <laughs> like, follow or, or get in contact with you or whatever, what how are, how are we doing that these days? Well, I have a website, um, BrittanyWagner.com. And then social media. I mean, I, I run my own social media. Okay. <laughs> which is fun. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, so Instagram, Twitter is Brittany underscore MS girl from Mississippi girl. Okay. And then Facebook is just Brittany Wagner and it's a fan page. Okay. Um, and you can, my DMs are open. So ee, you can <laughs> DM me. I mean, I don't all the time. I'm not one of those like. You can't be. No. You can't it's be too that. much. It's too many. And there's a lot of people that want like pictures of my feet and stuff. So mm. 
Uh, I don't. That is so fun. Don't respond to a lot of that, but but you know I do. You know you're gonna get more of those now. I know. <laughs> Every time I do a show, and like people will say, I did an interview not too long ago, and the guy was like, I googled you, and the mo- do you want to know what the most the thing the most that is googled about you the most is? And I was like thinking what? And he was like, you know, like the thing about Brittany Wagner that's googled the most. And I was thinking, oh god, I don't think I want to know. And he said, it's is is she single? Well, and I answered. I was like, "Yes, I'm single," uh, you know. And then it was like, "Oh Woo! no! Oh, I see this where this went." <laughs> wow! All you people come out of the woodwork. Nice. That's, that's not what. That's not what I, I see. Meant. I'm still attracting <laughs> the toxic loser. That's awesome. So, <laughs> so, oh yeah. Um, but yeah, you DMing me or um. If it's a, you know, you can, there's on my website, there's like a form you can fill out and submit. Okay. You know, if you want me to speak or anything like that. And then obviously my book is available wherever books are sold. And yeah. Next Chance You, right? Next Chance You, tools, tips, and tough love. And I love that. (laughs) I I know this is a big thing now. Like you you have an audio book and then you you read your own audio book, which I think is is so key for, especially the topic you're talking about. I love hearing your voice on that. It had to be you. Yeah. You know, they make you all, they made me audition for that. No, they didn't. Yeah, they did. It's just like Netflix all over again. Yeah, no, they make you, they paid me though. But they made, (laughs) (laughs) they're not doing anything anymore where I don't get paid. But they, they, uh, yeah, they make you, they made me audition. I had to read like two paragraphs in a chapter and submit it and audition. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? But I guess they just want to make sure that you can like read. I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't know. Um, (laughs) But still. I did. That's your book. And then when words. I won, when I was like, oh, I won. <laughs> I won the reading of my own book. I felt so privileged. Um, but I recorded it. But it was hard. That's that's hard. Oh, I bet. Writing a book is incredibly difficult. Recording it on audio might be harder. Okay. that I can see that being a challenge. Yeah, it's hard. It, it was five hours a day every day for like four days in a row. And you're just reading. And you're just reading. And then you're like, you have people in your ear. I mean, it's the whole thing. You're in a studio. Oh, actually, I was in, I don't know if I'm supposed to say it, but I was in this studio. And I had a piece in my ear, and you got people in New York and people here, and everyone's talking, and you're reading, and you've been reading for three hours, and your throat, you now you're like, you know, <laughs> everything's dry. And then they're like, stop. That wasn't even on the page. Like, you just, you know how when you read, you start to make up words? Well, I guess maybe even when it's your words, too. No, yeah, I was so changing it's... the whole book. I'm like, this is what I meant to say. That's like, even on the page. Okay. and the producer would be like, wait, where She's are you? book two. That's not even on the page. I'd be like, whoopsie, it should have been. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, or they'd be like, you're too Southern. I'm like, there's no such thing. Like, <laughs> stop right there. You're way too from New York. I'm going to read this in my Southern accent. Or, or I got like you're reading. It's too fat. You got to slow down. Oh. Apparently, I read really quick, fast, and so they would be like, "Slow down. You're all mm. your words are going together." So it's like all, there's all these people telling you, "Oh man, what to do?" And then you think you know how to pronounce a word. Apparently, you, you don't. don't. Oh, okay. And then they stop <laughs> you, and they're like, "That's not how you pronounce that." And then it's like you can't get the old pronunciation out of your head. So every time you get to that line, there's a panic, and you then stop because you're like. Oh my God! How do I, for, I don't know. I yeah. don't know what that word is anymore, and it it's hard. Okay, so you're further enforcing that I'm not writing a book. No, you I'm, should. I'm you should experience <laughs> it for sure. It's like one of those things everyone should do. It's, it's humbling, mm. no doubt. Then you, you you know you finally finish it, and you're, like these people here were amazing to work with, and they were so patient with me because oh my God, like. I started crying. Like, it was a whole thing. It was a whole thing. And they were so sweet and telling me stories of other people that had cried and so I wouldn't feel like it was just me. And and then you listen to it. Like, it, you're, you're all excited and then it comes out and you see it, like, on the book thing. And you're like, look, that's me on the book download Audible or whatever it's called. And then you click it and you start to hear your own voice and you're like, that's what I sound like? Oh, my God. The classic. Take it away. (laughs) That's forever like that, too. You have a lot of forever things. I have a ton of forever things. (laughs) Oh, that's – well – but that's cool. I love your experiences are fun, and it's fun now. I mean, I, getting to sit down and talk with you, I think there's going to be a, a, a greater personal connection. You do a great job of really connecting to your audience, so that's yeah. That, I think that's aided in the success that you've had. But 
it's it's fun for me personally now to be like, oh, okay. I know her. Now we're going off-roading and camping. Uh, we're doing it. Let's do it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a whole show. Let's do it. Let's, you heard it here. So everyone. <laughs> we need to make there sure it is. there's a hotel. Brittany Wagner <laughs> said it here. She's going camping. Y'all, that would be a comedy we're doing it. We're doing of it. errors. We're doing it. You've committed. It's Can we go somewhere like cool? Where I don't have to, I can't, look, I can't, where I don't have to actually, like, hike up a. Oh, I'm not going to make you hike. Oh. We'll what drive. are we going to do? We're going to drive. And then what? And you're going to Just see camp? Like, We're just going to set up camp and sit there and drink wine or something? Yeah. Oh, I got that all day. We'll do that. Let's we'll do, do it. That. I might scare you a little bit on the way there, but we'll do, do it. Do I? have <laughs> <laughs> to sleep in a tent? Yeah. On the ground? Yeah. Mm. We'll figure it out. <laughs> have an air mattress? All right, everyone. <laughs> Brittany, on next episode, Brittany Wagner and I go camping. camping. Um, And that's it, everyone. Uh, Social media, again, Brittany Wagner underscore MS. Girl. Girl. Yep. Um, No, it's just Brittany. Oh, Brittany, that's right. Brittany underscore MS. I mess it all that up. You're good. All right. Well, thank you very much for (laughs) being here. I really appreciate you you spending the time and taking time off from your Uber job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it's been great. (laughs) And uh, Mike Lover, we uh, ran out of time.